rather than making sustainability a question of a, of a moral uh, commitment or a feeling of guilt or a political priority, if it's simply a better design, it's going to win. All over the world, coal plants are being replaced by wind turbines and solar panels. With prices dropping, the proportion of our energy generated by sun and wind is expected to grow quickly in the coming decades. There are growing ambitions of bidding fossil fuels farewell, and not just in the Netherlands. By about 30 years from now, it is predicted that two-thirds of our global electricity will come from sustainable sources. What will this world running largely on renewable energy look like? Yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a good question, because I mean, I... You're testing my imagination, Martin. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. There's so much more that we have to think about. What effects will the energy transition have on the economy, politics, on how we live and move around? Surprisingly little thought has been given to this, but luckily there are people who have an idea of what might be to come. You can't see that much. They can to some extent envisage what will change when we start using a lot less coal, oil and gas. There are no toxins coming out of the chimney. We could actually turn the roof of this power plant into the first alpine ski slope of Denmark. Other opportunities will present themselves, but who will be prepared for them? Chinese people really think about things in much, much longer terms. We think about things in like 50, 60, 100 years. 10, 20 years, I worry the United States could lose its pole position. And that's our last advantage. If we lose that advantage, we will be in structural and irreversible decline. China is just like, this works, we're going for it, right? the entire country, boom. This is Backlight. Welcome to a sustainable future. In recent years, we have become used to houses with solar panels on the roof, and electric cars are no exception anymore. People everywhere are realizing that we are moving towards a radically different looking world. We're going to parade and a trip through the city of Leeuwarden. We take a break. We take a break from all the apparatus that don't fit in. A blowblazer on a benzine motor. That doesn't fit in the future. A gas furnace. All these things we bring with us in a sort of last trip to thank the apparatus for their proven services. In the coming decades, the proportion of our energy generated renewably will continue to grow. We will move closer to the end of coal, oil and gas. But this shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources will lead to radical changes outside of the energy sector as well. I think by mid-century, 2050, we'll see two-thirds of the world's electricity generated by renewable sources. My hope is that we will accomplish a majority of the world's electricity from just two renewable sources, wind and solar electricity. Varun Sivaram is a researcher at the US Council on Foreign Relations. He's seen huge developments in renewable energy from up close. I've been in the solar industry for over a decade now. If you told me a decade ago in 2008 that solar electricity would have fallen in price by over a factor of 10, over 90%, I would have told you you're crazy. There's no way this is going to happen, right? And here we are. Solar electricity has in fact gotten so cheap, you know, around the world you're seeing bids for solar electricity that are less than three cents or two cents per kilowatt hour. It's the basic unit of electricity generation. That was unheard of just five years ago, 10 years ago. But here we are, right? I think a lot of us focus primarily on the coming changes to the energy sector. We stop our analysis there. But there are so many other knock-on effects to the rest of the economy because energy is the foundation of how the global economy runs. So in addition to you know, the, the energy sector becoming less carbon intensive, more digital, 
possibly more decentralized, the rest of the global economy could change the way it functions as well. If energy is the cornerstone of global society, and if its sources change, what else will change? Danish architect Bjarke Ingels has spent a lot of time thinking about this. He sees the outward appearances of cities and buildings changing vastly in a world powered mainly by renewable energy. Maybe we are somewhat living in a constructively optimistic time. Lately, this kind of 60s belief in the future has maybe come back. And I think the next, the next many decades we'll see an explosive development uh, in the physical and the built environment. I think maybe people have started daring, imagining that we can actually make meaningful uh, change again. Technological change, climate change, no matter where the change is coming from, that change means that the framework we created for our lives and our society suddenly doesn't fit anymore because people are doing things differently now. And if we as architects can look and listen and learn from this change, we have an amazing opportunity to accommodate what is changing, uh, to solve these new problems, explore these new possibilities and actually give form to the future to give form to the future that we would like to live in. The Swedish city of Malmö is a testing ground for sustainable living. The city boasts many projects and districts that prioritize sustainability. Like the greenhouse flats, where sustainable living is encouraged. I had some really cool chilies here before. So I had a big, really really hot chili plant with it was called the jalokia chocolate and we oh, thought it was we thought it was good, one, of the, one of the hottest yeah. but we didn't know that <laughs> we thought it's chocolate you know the name didn't sound we didn't actually look at the the scale mm -hmm. but then uh, luckily when we picked the first one we decided well, let's just take a little bit and then we realized actually I had to, when i tasted it it was so hot mm -hmm. i said i have to go online and see what this is all about <laughs> then we realized it was one of the hottest so we had to give give away because it was too much it was a really big uh, plant What's the difference between living in a apartment building like this and a regular apartment building? The Where difference? You? Oh, well, you have to sign that green contract. That's one difference. Um, and what's a green contract? It stipulates that you're going to try to have as much green or plants growing for as the majority of the year as possible. So. And you have to recycle I don't know what happens if you break the green contract, actually. <laughs> but uh, yes, you need to take part in the communal uh, growing areas as well. And Did you both have sort of like an interest for, for gardening also before you came here? Well... In theory, in yes. In theory. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea of it and the actual work involved is also... That's, that's the other side, so... And we have quite a lot of food growing, mm. like tomatoes and sugar snacks. Yes, and squash. Uh, and squash stuff. and yeah, a lot of things. So that we sometimes can take. I mean, here, tomatoes grow till November here in this wow. in this area. Last year it did. So, so we had a lot of tomatoes because yeah. we had <laughs> so quite a few tomato left. plants last year. Every year we, we're learning, um, learning and we've changed what we're doing. Mm. Um, kale, we had a lot of kale. <laughs> that kale is nice. I like kale. <laughs> so we're being a little bit more diverse this year, yeah. trying trying a different approach. The things that are, are in the building make you think about your behaviour as an individual, and then make you reassess what you're doing. Mm. For example, the taps when you push on the taps, um, the hot water. If you want to get really hot water, you have to press a button to actually let it go to the to the hot or to get the high pressure. So you're consciously making that decision. Otherwise, you have to question, well, do I really need hot water for this uh, washing or whatever it is I'm doing? Or mm -hmm. um, then the, the plugs, the away and home button that you press when you're leaving, that switches off everything. Um, so you're conserving electricity in that, in that way. So you, it, it makes it easy for you to live in this way. You yeah. become more conscious and aware, yeah. definitely. <laughs> With time, it becomes a bit more automatic. And the beginning, maybe not. 
It's not just individual buildings like this that are sustainable in Malmo. Entire districts are being designed to run on renewable energy. Like the Western Harbour Sustainable District, designed 10 years ago. 20 years ago, there was nothing here, more than shipyard industry that has uh, gone broke. Then the city of Malmö fighted for survival, more or less, and has gone from once being this huge shipyard industry with 10,000 employees here to a rather living city with uh, more than 250 different companies and plus 12,000 workplaces. So what, what kind of place is this? Where did you take us here? You can't see that much, but uh, this is like the, the uh, one of the two hearts of the energy solution here in, in the Western Harbor. Beneath us, 100 meters, we have a limestone aquifer, a storage of water. We used that for the purposes of heating and cooling, just like a thermos. We cool down the aquifer winter time to be used summertime, and we use uh, heating from summertime to be brought up winter time. It works quite well. The discussion about sustainability was dominated by a kind of gloomy worldview, like um, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. And the whole story was about how much of our existing quality of life are we willing to sacrifice in order to afford being sustainable. And we thought that's not a very attractive uh, standpoint or viewpoint. So rather than making sustainability a question of a moral commitment or a feeling of guilt, or a political priority, if it's simply a better design, it's going to win. Do you think that the inhabitants, are they aware that this is climate neutral area? On a daily basis, no. I think one key component of really being successful with that is that it should be easy. It should be automated. It should be uh, seamless. Bjarke Ingels would like to take things one step further. He shows how energy efficient designs can make buildings more varied and attractive than they are now. I think when you look at the developments in architecture that brought us here or that contributed to bringing us to this situation is that when modernism arrived and the international style of modernism, uh, it, it was called the international style because buildings started looking the same everywhere. And of course, the climate is very different in the north of Finland than it is from the north of Africa. So um, at the same time as the advent of modern architecture was the advent of modern building services. And building services were new technologies that came with new freedoms. We had suddenly electric lights, so we could make really deep floor plates with abundance of light. We weren't dependent on daylight for, for being able to see, so buildings got deeper and deeper. Uh, we had mechanical ventilation, so we didn't have to be able to uh, open the windows, or so we could like just pump uh, fresh air through the building. Uh, and we had suddenly air conditioning and central heating, so we weren't dependent on the thickness of the walls or the orientation of the windows. So all of these freedoms meant that the architecture of the building did less and less. It became just a container of space. Uh, and then what made the building inhabitable was this gas gosling machinery that was pumping electricity and air and temperature through the building. So we had big boring boxes. The architecture didn't do anything. It became more and more generic. And we had a basement full of gas gosling machinery that, that sort of kept uh, the, the patient alive. Um, and you can say building services is a mechanical compensation for the fact that the building is bad at what it's designed for, namely human occupants. Um, so I think part of, part of what we are thinking about now, because we work in a lot of different countries uh, and a lot of different climates, is to um, return to this idea where the building responds to its environment. A building we're just finishing now in China, in Shenzhen, uh, is for the main uh, energy company of Shenzhen. Uh, it's in a humid subtropical uh, climate. 
So uh, if you're making a big office building in a tropical climate, um, you want to, of course, maximize views and daylight, but you also want to minimize glare and thermal exposure, uh, you know, using air conditioning. So uh, we designed the facade, if you imagine, like a sort of a zigzaggy uh, facade. So the sides that are facing against uh, the prevailing sun direction, to the south, for instance, are always closed, and the other side is always entirely open. So that means that when you're standing inside uh, and you look uh, away from the sun, it's all glass, but when you turn around and look in the direction of the sun, it's bamboo walls washed in daylight. It has like a very feminine, elegant appearance, but it also reduces energy consumption with 30%. A greater proportion of sustainable energy being used will alter not just the appearance of buildings, but of entire cities. Power plants will no longer need to be hidden away in the outskirts of the city. When we look over there, this is our, uh, the brick building over there is our energy central. So is this like a, a power plant? Yeah, it's like a power plant with, with the two rather big heat pumps. But normally you wouldn't place a power plant in the middle of a neighborhood, I suppose. No, but uh, when it's chimney free and completely silent, it's not a problem. It's kind of interesting, the fact that you can introduce energy infrastructure in the middle of a city rather than, you know, somewhere where the smokestacks don't cause too much trouble. No, exactly. Like You can say the traditional zoning of the city had to do with certain, certain things are simply so noisy are so nasty that we have to put them very far away. Uh, and in that sense, uh, but then we can also see that, you know, once a power plant shuts down, it's an amazing building. So with clean technology, you don't have to wait until the power plant shuts down. We can reinvent it. We're just finishing this uh, power plant here in Copenhagen that turns waste into energy. So uh, a bag of like three kilos of ho household waste turns into four hours of electricity and five hours of district heating. Um, but it's also the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world, so there are no toxins coming out of the chimney. So not only is it a better technology, it's completely different. You don't have to be far away from a, a sort of a polluting power plant. We could actually turn the roof of this power plant into the first alpine ski slope of, uh, of Denmark. It's gonna open in October. Children that are born in Copenhagen this year, they will not know of a world where you can't ski on the roof of the power plant. So imagine if that's your baseline, how much higher these, uh, these children can imagine, like how much further they're gonna be able to uh, imagine things because they just start on a completely different level than what we did. It's not only our direct environment that will change in a future sustainable world. The increase in the use of solar and wind energy will really shake up international relations. Energy is one of the top, if not the top, issues in geopolitics. You can explain a whole lot of international relations by looking at global flows of energy and the distribution of energy resources. And to date, energy geopolitics has been dominated by the geopolitics of fossil fuels. Going forward, though, we may enter a world where clean energy becomes a dominant or at least larger share of uh, the world's energy system. And so we ought to stop looking just at the geopolitics of fossil fuels and more at the geopolitics of clean energy. The White House has a long history with solar panels on the roof. In 1979, they first went on the roof. Jimmy Carter put them on. Then in the 80s, Republican President Ronald Reagan took the solar panels off the roof of the White House. Barack Obama in 2010 put panels back on. And now we have President Trump. Now who knows, President Trump uh, you know, may very well keep him on, but he hasn't been great to solar recently. There's a whole range of things that President Trump is doing to roll back President Obama's environmental policies. I bet you uh, solar panels may very well not stay on that roof. Uh, I don't think you can see him. The only thing you can see from here are the snipers. You may have been blessed as a country to have had fossil fuel deposits in the past, and that largely determined whether you were going to be an energy exporter or an energy importer. 
no longer. Most countries have some endowment of sun and wind or hydroelectric resources or geothermal resources. And so suddenly, many countries can become energy producers, maybe even energy exporters. It all depends on how enthusiastic a country is going to be to exploit its clean energy endowment. Be surprised. You wouldn't believe how fast China is going green. It's going green at gigascale and gigapace. One country is particularly enthusiastic about a future greener world, China. It's the world's biggest investor in wind turbines and solar panels. And there's a clear plan behind it. You have to realize that China doesn't really want to be dependent on other countries. It knows that if its factories go down, right, then it won't produce products and then GDP won't go up. And so to produce products, guess what you need? You need energy, right? So if you, if you can have renewable energy, which is, you know, pretty much free, right, and then you become independent, then you have energy security, which is economic security, which is national security in some sense, right? So I think that the very beginning of our drive for renewable energy actually started from that point of view. In 2007, Peggy Liu founded Yucha, an organization that aims to make China more sustainable. Her ideas on the role of sustainability in China are regularly adopted by Chinese leader Xi Jinping. In particular, her vision of the China dream. The China dream, you know, to me is really about everybody has some moderate form of prosperity together and that China together we thrive, right? This, this collective consciousness is very important to China. Um, so helping fill the gap between urban and rural, rich and poor, um, to to make sure that all of us are going on this really, really, really fast journey together, right? We're leaping, right, at, at giga scale, at giga pace, but we, we want to leap together. The China dream, a collective push for greater prosperity, has increasingly turned into a green dream. Like in this coal region to the north of Hefei, where the sustainable future is being built literally over the remains of the damaging past. Chinese Rahu 漂浮电站,也就是说有效地利用了这块的一个水域面积。我们这个就是说这个电站是一个就是说总容量150兆瓦的一个电站,这样。一个土地平整费用,因为我们是在水面上建的,就是说不需要土地平整。
以及后期的一个运维除草的一个成本。结晶硅型太阳能电池板，它有一个特性，就是在高温状态下，它的转化效率会降低。太阳能电池板呢，每降低一度，可提高功率呢百分之啊零点一。同同容量的地面电站相比啊，我们建设周期要短，因为我们就是说这个拼接啊，就是说是非常简便的，就是说我们的中，就是说施工工期啊，就是说非常的短啊，是这样。那那这个采访这个大的也可以吗？我喜欢后宅、新能源发展。以前的污染呢太严重，对广大农民的身体不是很好。China has huge ambitions for solar energy in particular. But Varun Sivaram believes that simply building even more solar panels won't be enough. In our current system, with our current technologies, we're headed for a wall. It seems just so compelling. We ought to buy this solar panel and generate this very cheap electricity. The problem is all of those electrons get produced at the wrong time. And if you produce them all at the wrong time, right in the middle of the day, when nobody wants them anymore, we've already met all of our demands, we've met all the air conditioners, and what we really need is dinnertime power. When people come home from work and turn on their lights, but there's no sun at that point, it's set, the next solar panel will do nothing for you. So the idea is, from a pure economics point of view, it may not make sense to build new solar and wind uh, farms just because their cost has fallen. Because if their value falls even faster, the value may be below the cost. Solar and wind, it's going to hit a wall if we don't find ways to flexibly use it. Lithium-ion batteries are too expensive. They'll continue to be too expensive, and they frankly are only good for storing energy for a few hours at a time, not the days or even weeks or months or seasons that these intermittent renewable energy sources need. We're going to need new battery designs. We even need new battery designs for electric vehicles in order for them to really compete against fossil fuel, petroleum-fueled vehicles. And unless we invest right now in those technologies, they're going to come from China. China is, is ramping up its investment, and it's Chinese authors that are being increasingly published in top-tier scientific journals in solar innovation, in wind innovation, in battery innovation. So I think the signal is loud and clear. We are focusing on the wrong things. The attitudes of Chinese people the policies that the Chinese government have laid down, the, the amount of infrastructure that we've put in place over the last decade is tremendous. I mean, you, you really can't recognize it between 2007 and 2018. So all of these colorful bikes are basically free for anybody to rent for almost nothing. And these are the closest bikes to me. Right, so I can find the closest bike. But of course, I've got a bike right in front of me, and I'm going to unlock it simply by scanning the QR code right there. And it just unlocked. Did I you hear the it. right? So this basically solves the last mile problem. I have three subway lines right here underneath my feet, underneath my 29th floor apartment, and I can go to line two, line 12, line 13, and then I can unlock a bike, I can go to the bar or the grocery store that I want to go to, and I just lock it right there, and I'm done. There's no need for cars whatsoever in a transit-centered life. One of the things that I've realized is that it's not enough to just have really cool, whizzy technology, right, to just invest in technology. And this is something, a little bit of a blasphemy from somebody who graduated from MIT as an electrical engineer. And so this is very complex. It's not, there's no one single bullet like solar or nuclear or wind or anything that's going to save the day. China is looking beyond wind and solar energy. Dutchman Joost van der Hoek has lived and worked in Shanghai for years. An urban planner, he develops new towns and neighborhoods all over China. Urban design plays a major role in a sustainable future. 
Wat in Shanghai heel opmerkelijk is, is dat rommers en motoren al in een heel vroeg stadium, al, al acht, negen jaar geleden, zijn overgeschakeld op elektriciteit. Dus altijd als ik in Amsterdam ben en ik zie weer een uh, benzine of een um, brommer of scooter voorbij komen met veel lawaai en stank, dan denk ik altijd, hè, hebben ze dat hier nog? Ik denk dat de Chinese steden door hun hoge dichtheid en in een aantal gevallen ook een excellent openbaar vervoerssysteem, dat de, de duurzaamheid er vooral in zit, dat je de energieconsumptie eigenlijk aan het begin uh, al beperkt, doordat je gewoon niet zoveel auto's en autokilometers nodig hebt. Het elementaire verschil tussen Nederland en China is dat in Nederland woont 80% in huis met een tuin en in China woont eigenlijk 80% in een appartement appartementengebouw, in een hoog appartementengebouw, uh, in nabijheid van voorzieningen en werk. En daarin zit een enorme energiereductie. Niet alleen omdat een appartement minder energie nodig heeft om te verwarmen en te koelen, et cetera, uh, maar ook omdat je dus de beweging beperkt. Dus eigenlijk is de grootste sta in de weg uh, in, in Nederland op weg naar een duurzame samenleving, zeg ik als stedenbouwkundige, dat is het huis met de tuin. Als je nou vraagt, hoe ziet nou een stuk stad eruit wat echt een bijdrage zou kunnen geven aan de energietransitie? Dan denk ik dat het Shuhui district binnen de stad Shanghai daar wel een mooi voorbeeld van is. Op drie tot vijf minuten lopen van deze plek heb je vier metrostations, drie verschillende lijnen. En dat helpt enorm aan een stad waar je weinig autokilometers nodig hebt om te komen waar je wilt. De wijze waarop het hier over vele honderden vierkante kilometers met uh, 600 kilometer metrolijn met uh, honderden stations uh, tot werkelijkheid is gekomen is wel echt uh, futuristisch, echt uniek. Sterker nog, eigenlijk uh, hebben we hier een omgekeerde werkelijkheid. Dus het openbaar vervoer is niet meer iets wat achteraf wordt aangebracht, maar wat eigenlijk de backbone is, de basisrandvoorwaarde voor de transformatie van de bestaande stad, maar met name ook voor de uitleg uh, van nieuwe stadsdelen. Het autobezit aan zich wordt ook heel erg afgeremd. Een nummerbord bijvoorbeeld uh, kost al 20.000 euro, voor een bedrijf richting 40.000 euro. En dat betekent uh, dat de aanschaf van een auto toch voor een groot deel in het nummerbord zit. Dat kan je ook niet zomaar kopen, dan moet je uh, meedoen aan een loterij. Uh, en die wordt uh, één keer in de maand uh, gehouden en soms duurt het wel een jaar voordat je hem een keer uh, uh, wint. Ja, hier zien we dus voor ons uit de Xuxia Dat is een van de belangrijkste commerciële knooppunten van de stad. Kantoren, wonen, voorzieningen, uh, malls, kantoortorens, uh, experience entertainment, nog meer kantoren. Dus hier uh, zien we echt uh, wat het openbaar vervoer kan betekenen voor de stedelijke levendigheid en de stedelijke dynamiek. Want als we het aantal auto's wat we hier zien afzetten tegen het aantal mensen wat hier rondloopt, dan rijden we hier vreselijk weinig auto's. What's really interesting about China is, is that the thinking of China is moving much faster than the infrastructure development of China. What's very dangerous for people is to judge China at any one point in time what China looks like with its infrastructure or air quality today, right? Because China is moving so quickly. What you need to do is understand the motivations of the Chinese government and the Chinese people and the policies that are driving the next five years of the future. And then just realizing that things that they say will happen will happen very quickly. China is just like, this works, we're going for it, right? The entire country, boom. China really does act in a very, I think, much more efficient way when it comes to large-scale change is because it, it, it says this is the change that we want, yeah. right? It might be healthy China 2030, right? It could be a climate change plan, the first one that came out in 2007, this is what we're going to accomplish. It could be carbon emissions. It could be really anything. It could be um, $500 billion into uh, high-speed rail over the next few years. And then it 
and then it makes it happen because all, all of the people underneath it know that their job is on the line if they don't reach it. If you think about every single sustainability solution, China's got somebody who's thinking about how to scale it. China's got a city or 25 cities piloting it. And one of those models, one of those darts is gonna hit the bullseye, right? And as long as we can figure out that one model that works, boom, it'll scale. And when it scales, it scales it in like one to three years across the country of a billion, 1.3 billion people, right? So that, that's the magic of China. It's not just about the technology, it's about the people who are thinking in systems in a connected way. Out. You're pushing it to the ground, right? One more time. Yes, perfect. That's the chi going through your body. So what you want to do is, when she gets good enough, she'll be able to actually project the chi through different parts of your body. Don't go so close. Do you see how she's like, oh, hey, you guys. I think we need to move to the left. Okay. Yeah. You have to step back and think about the way that Chinese think about history and the future. We think about things in like 50, 60, 100 years, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, if you're only thinking about, let's say, the next three months quarterly reports, or you're thinking about the next four years, your election term, then you might not be concerned about things like climate change. But in China, I think it was Mao Zedong who first thought up this aqueduct that would bring water from one part of China all the way to the other end of China. It's now just being built, right? And so Chinese people really think about things in much, much longer terms. China's long-term mindset influences not only its plans for its own clean energy, but also its plans to become a global leader of the growing sustainable technology market. China is basically saying, hey, let's work with all these countries from Kazakhstan to Spain, right, down to Pakistan to Kenya, and let's economically shake hands, right, and build this cross-border logistics network. And from there, you can have cultural connections and communication and soft power. You can have uh, increased economy. Um, I, I think that as the Belt and Road becomes built along you know, China to Russia to Spain and down through maritime routes to Africa, what you'll see is, is that hopefully these types of sustainable solutions will then go into the infrastructure that's built in the cross-border logistics all along this belt and road that will reach three quarters of humanity. I think by 2030 that there's a good chance that China will not only be able to meet the Paris Agreements, but it will be able to showcase to the world what kind of solutions can be exported outside of China to reduce emissions at scale. If China views sustainable technology as the ideal motor for the economy, while the US is slamming on the brakes, what does this mean for America's future? 10 or 20 years, we will no longer be the largest funder of energy innovation. We will no longer be the source of many of the exciting uh, new technologies, uh, both in you know, the production and generation of electricity as well as the digital use of electricity. You know, digital innovations are where we shine. Uh, we have been developing the smart grid technologies of the future, the smart thermostats of the future, uh, the autonomous vehicles of the future. China is going to overtake us in all of these technologies if we do not keep a laser focus on innovation. So 10, 20 years, I worry the United States could lose its pole position. And that's our last advantage. If we lose that advantage, we will be in structural and irreversible decline. In about 30 years from now, two thirds of our global electricity will be from sustainable sources. This will have huge effects on other parts of the economy. 
But architect Bjarke Ingels is confident about the future. I think maybe people have started daring, imagining that we can actually make meaningful uh, change again. And I think from the point of view of the architect, the last 20 years, innovation and resources has been so obsessed with uh, the immaterial, the virtual, the digital, uh, also because of the, the scalability of things. You can scale things in the virtual environment or in the digital environment almost at no cost. Uh, I think lately that ingenuity has come back to the real world. Uh, electric cars, driverless cars, uh, robotic manufacturing, um, the Internet of Things. Suddenly, all the, all the technological innovation that was like somehow happening in its own little bubble has actually started spreading into the, into the physical environment. I do believe that the rise of cheap, renewable energy is going to reduce the cost and the price of electricity. Uh, I believe, for example, we're already seeing signs of these cheap electrons uh, being generated, for example, in Abu Dhabi, Chile, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, India. Uh, all, all of these are signs that these technologies are going to bring down the cost of electricity. Very cheap electricity could turn out to have as much of a transformative impact on the world uh, as the internet did. Because it allows the economy to use electricity in ways it never thought it would use it before. That's a powerful concept. So when we think about the future of renewables, we should stop just thinking about, will renewables displace fossil fuels for this use? Instead, we should think about what new uses can renewables open up? Let me give you a few examples. Desalination could be a new way of generating fresh water rather than relying on increasingly scarce fresh water as climate change takes its toll. Vertical farming can harness LED lighting that uses virtually free electricity in order to produce agricultural products that we didn't think that we could produce at scale and sustainably uh, using conventional uh, processes. I think we can get there and I'm optimistic we can get there and if we do get there all kinds of good things will happen. Just as we've been talking about, it'll transform not just the energy sector, but also adjacent sectors. The whole global economy will shift to take advantage of this new abundant energy source. No, I, I, I definitely read a lot of science fiction. Uh, science fiction is a story where the narrative has been triggered by some form of innovation. Uh, so you see a world that is like the world you know it, but there's one new invention, and that invention can be a social invention, a political invention, a cultural invention, or often it's a technological invention. So the whole story becomes a narrative exploration of the potential consequences of this one invention. But by changing this one thing, it has these sort of cascading consequences, and the design becomes a design exploration of the potential consequences, good and bad, problems we need to solve and the possibilities we can explore of making that one change. So suddenly, rather than you as the designer having to come up with all kinds of things, uh, all you have to do is f follow the consequences of this one change uh, and, and, and you'll discover a whole world that you didn't even know existed. We need folks at every, you know, every level, policy, business, academia, science, thinking about this extraordinarily important challenge. Unfortunately, we do not have enough folks doing that. And I, my plea uh, is for more people to think about how we might enter a world that runs off of a majority of solar power by the end of the century. <laughs>